Well, clearly it was never a red card. I don't know what he was thinking of. Hello and welcome to the Sunderland Stadium of Light for our little film. The stadium, as you may or may not know, was built in 1997, that's when it opened, uh, replacing the old Roker Park, which was 99 years old and of no further use. Uh, the stadium was built over the old Weymouth Colliery, which was closed in 1993. Uh, when the stadium was being built, with some ridiculous stories at the time about how it might sink because it was above a mine. It's not actually above a mine. There are three shafts surrounding the stadium. They're not directly underneath it, so they go way down a mile or so and then out to the coal, which is still there beneath the North Sea. There are caps venting, uh, letting out the, the methane from the vents, but there never is and never was any danger. Although regular checks are still made for gases. Everyone's perfectly safe. Now, when the club moved from Roker Park, it didn't forget its immediate past, uh, as evidenced by what you say here. This is some lattice work from the old main stand at Roker. Uh, Roker Park designed by the famous football ground architect Archibald Leach, who also designed Goodison Park and Ibrox, among other places. Um, it was reported when the club first moved to the Stadium of Light that uh, the club had scrapped all of this stuff. Um, the report was wrong. Heaven forfend that the newspaper would get it wrong. It wasn't this newspaper I hasten to add, and the club still awaits the apology. The inaugural game here was a friendly against the mighty Ajax of Amsterdam uh, in July 1997. At midnight, one minute uh, into the day of the match, the announcement was made in what is now Quinney's Bar that this, the, the ground was to be called the Stadium of Light. It did not go down well at the time. Angry supporters outside um, weren't happy. It was assumed that by many it was going to be called the Weymouth Stadium or the Colliery Stadium or some such. The, the name Stadium of Light, but the, the light refers to the light um, of, of the Davy lamp, the light coming out of a tunnel or a shaft. Uh, it's not actually named after the Estadio de Luz, home of Benfica in Portugal. This is the magnificent marble entrance to the Stadium of Light, middle of the West Stand. And behind me is the unmissable painting by Thomas Hemi. Give him his full name. It was Thomas Marie Madawaska Hemi, 1852 to 1937. The painting is of a game between Sutherland and Aston Villa on January the 2nd, 1895. The game took place at one of Sutherland's previous grounds uh, at Newcastle Road. This is even before Roker Park. Um, it finished 4 4. Sorry to spoil the, the result for you if you've got it tipped. Um, Almost everyone on the pitch is in the, is in the painting. It's been suggested that Aston Villa were chasing a last minute equaliser, but it was actually 4-4 with 10 minutes to go. So I think Mr. Heaney just had a bit of artistic license. Um, it's a huge painting. It used to be on loan at Sunderland Museum until it came over here when the stadium opened. We're now standing behind reception, behind that famous painting, and we're still at street level. We're about to go down into the tunnel. So it's ever so exciting through the tunnel and on the pitch side and it's uh, it's it's quite dramatic. Come this way. So we're now going down to the pitch side, the low street level, that's how the stadium was built. We're now in the tunnel, the tunnel, the players tunnel and you, you can see me going out. Now this is where those of us who were absolutely rubbish at football have a little fantasy to ourselves. So here we are at pitch side, next to the home dugout where all of the uh, swearing and chewing of gum goes on on a match day. Now the ball of the stadium uh, is, as you can see, quite spectacular. Most of you are familiar with this part of the stadium. The bit below ground level, which is where we are, the first tier, um, that was the concrete was poured in. It came off the back of a lorry and it was poured in. Everything else was delivered precast and delivered by a crane into what we see now. Uh, the north stand, the top part of that, did not exist when the stadium first opened in 1997. It came about three years later, which took the capacity of the stadium up from about 42,000 to around about 48,000, depending on segregation. The more eagle-eyed amongst you will have spotted behind me the pitch, which is actually crucial to the proceeding. Everything that goes well on the pitch means that everything's well for the rest of the club. Um, it's about average size for a professional football pitch and 
despite the appearances, not entirely grass. It's a mixture of grass and a sort of plastic artificial grass called cis grass. It has 18 sprinklers which are used regularly. Um, I'm I've seen it years ago when the sprinklers have been on in the pouring rain during half time. Despite appearances, the pitch is not a billiard table flat. There is a camber, it's a spine running down the centre of the length of the pitch. Uh, and it's about a foot higher than the edges. That's to allow water to flow away. Like all good stadiums, it has undersoil heating too. Essentially, it's a giant radiator beneath the pitch. There are 26 miles of plastic piping there, 10 inches below the ground. Hot water runs through them. There's a boiler room near here. I won't tell you where it is. But essentially, that's how it works. The same as the radiator in your bathroom. It was a clear red card. He's got nothing to complain about. Right, we're back in the players' tunnel, and that bit of Tom Fowler you just saw was filmed here. It's very simple, actually. All it is just the backdrop where the the post-match ranting and raving or gloating goes on, right in front of the world's media. Right now, we are, we really are in the inner sanctum here. This is the home dressing room. It's a bit uh, more spruce than it was originally. It was originally it was just uh, hooks on a wall. Um, Got this nice uh, woodwork effect now, and it'll all be locked up on a match day. The door's locked on a match day. Nobody gets in apart from those who are absolutely essential. Uh, there are showers, baths for players, the, the older players, um, and, and everything you would want down here. So there is a warm up area for warming up, as, as you might expect. The away changing room has no such thing. Boo hiss, we're in the away dressing room. Um, it's not quite the same. It's, uh, you immediately notice it isn't quite as nice as the home dressing room. Uh, there's no warm up area. Uh, it does have bats, but they aren't quite the super duper large jacuzzi type bats that you have in the home side. Um, just plain old hooks. Uh, not entirely dissimilar to Hilton Road playing fields. You'll also notice this, was, this has been here since day one. The, the sort of beige and blue tiling effect. That was to create a murky effect to make visiting players a bit more depressed and ready for it. Now, it might all be psycho babble and nonsense, but it was deemed to be at the time worth a try. Things do go wrong sometimes, even in a modern stadium. I think it was in the year 2010 or 2011 that uh, the visitors were Manchester United and sadly, some people might say, um, a sewage pipe burst and its contents ended in here. Much to the chagrin of uh, Sir Alex Ferguson. Um, he took it quite well, actually, it has to be said. Uh, and it was referred to in the newspapers as something gate, but we'd better not refer to exactly what the term was. This is one of the officials' changing rooms where the referees and uh, line assistants run up and down. Uh, there are several of them. In the early days, there was just male and there was female, although in that time, the female female dressing rooms was rarely if ever used but it's quite commonplace these days uh, they don't uh, they don't mention the gender these days it's just match officials one match officials two etc but they are they are very well looked after this is the media suite or press lounge as it used to be known and it is what it is uh, the, the, the world's media depending on the size of the game that's been going on gathered here and they're they're probe managers uh, you get the occasional tantrum delivered from this very chair. There was a beauty last season from Reading manager Paul Ince, whose thoroughly boring side were beaten 1-0. This was pointed out to him and he went berserk. Very entertaining. Yes? And behind that door, I can tell you, I'll take you into my confidence here, that Samson the cat and his girlfriend Delilah actually used to, used to live in that room. Some people say that the costumes of them were put in there, but it was the actual Samson and Delilah. It's now a teaching facility, much of this area is. A lot of educational work goes on here. And this uh, is the treatment room, uh, a bit overused last season, some might say. It's right next to the changing rooms, apparently, and it's seen some interesting blood and gore over the years. This is the lift to the basements. There are four lifts in the stadium. Uh, two posh ones and two more servicey type lifts. You need to know the code to get in, get down into this uh, one, so we're quite privileged. This is the area beneath the Premier Concourse, which is the highest part of the seating deck outside. Uh, it's it's rather nicer than the rest of what you might call the, the ordinary parts of the stadium. Um, there's concourse all the way around, there's more room here. The lower concourse is a bit more restricted because of the geometry of the stadium to do with the pitch being sunk. Uh, 
this has been open since day one when it was being built it was described as the club was trying to sell tickets as an airport lounge style bar the, they made that description in good faith but it didn't quite happen however it's still rather nice uh, when it was built plenty of female toilets the number of female toilets outnumber the male toilets won't go into the details of that but it was to do with the uh, demography people realized at the time what was happening in football more and more women were attending matches and they've been proved correct we're now in one of 48 executive boxes they're all on the second floor of the stadium and very nice they are too obviously used on a match day but also sometimes during the week for for meetings with various people uh, and companies who hire them um, so you have your match day experience here, a lovely meal and uh, a few drinkies and then kick off and you step outside leaving your drink behind you, there are no drinks allowed, this is the law of the land not the law of the stadium and you come out here, these are rather nice padded seats, beautiful view of the game, camera gantry is just below us so you can uh, hurl abuse at commentators and so forth, no you don't, no you don't, one of the best seats in the house. This box here is actually a double box knocked through there and it uh, it serves as a studio when the live coverage is given to Sunderland home games so there's obviously some very famous people sat in here uh, Roy Keane for example uh, likes to contradict everybody else sitting around the table from here um, sometimes the fans will spot an old favourite like Kevin Phillips and they'll, they'll surge and start singing his name and so forth sometimes they'll see someone like Alan Shearer and uh, they don't tend to mention it as much this rather nice part of the building is the box holders bar so the executive boxes are one floor up from here and at half time and full time the, the good box holders come here and disport themselves with a pims and orange we, we won't go in the james herring suite because it's a bit busy at the moment but uh, i can't say that from memory it's it's one of the the, the nicest but not the largest uh, suite in the stadium it is quite beautiful in there named after the author james herriot who despite a lot of people out there who were wrong about it, he's, he was a Sunderland man, he had a Scottish accent, he was born in Sunderland and considered himself a Maccam. He was born in Brandling Street in Roker, where a blue plaque was unveiled to him, finally, in 2021. And this place was named after him, he's made life president of Sunderland AFC in 1993. Um, unfortunately, he never got to see the Stadium of Light because he died in 1995. But his, uh, his children are still passionate Southern supporters and are regularly seen here. This is the largest suite in the stadium. Um, it's used to be just called the Banqueting Suite. It's now the Montgomery Suite, named after Sunderland's record appearance maker, the great goalkeeper, Jimmy Montgomery, of course. Um, you can get about 400 people in here, and it's quite a sight on a match day. It looks quite nice at the moment, actually, but when it's all laid out, band on the stage there, uh, you get beautiful service in here, and it's recommended uh, for a number of functions. They've been kind enough to let us in here, so I should point out really that you can have your wedding here, 21st birthday, your anniversary, your bar mitzvah, you name it, this is the place to be. This is the players' lounge where after a match, the players and their wives and girlfriends all come and socialise. And they're all very nice to each other. You sometimes get visiting players in here as well. I'm sure it's all very jolly. Uh, just for clarity, I actually used to work in the Stadium of Light and that wall, we were told one time, to put up portraits of all the current players in alphabetical order and was supposed to have it done by the end of the day. I got someone else to do it, I can't use a screwdriver. The problem was it was also a transfer deadline day. So the lads who were putting it up had to merely hope that suddenly didn't sign anybody whose name was lower down the alphabet and they'd have to move the whole lot. Now th this is another inner sanctum. It's the boardroom. It's not really used very much outside of a match day and it's, it's quite beautiful. <coughs> um, now this table, beautiful round table, is made of pear wood. Um, it was made by the same company who made furniture for the Beatles. The Beatles had a company called Apple and all of their furniture for their offices was made from Applewood. So Powerwood is very soft and it needs special wax to clean it with. You don't just whack a bit of Mr Sheen on that. The table cost in about 1997-98 because the boardroom wasn't open at first. Um, it cost around about £30,000. So you're going back 25 years after this is an expensive table, so I don't know what it would cost now. The chairs at the time, I think they, from memory, cost around £1,500 each, and as I say, 25 years ago. Consequently, uh, we're too frightened to actually sit in them, we should just admire them. 
it is a, it's quite a beautiful room though and over there is what's called an ante room so all of the, the great and good have been in here uh, from football except for Roman Abramovich there's a story behind that which I better not tell to the camera still in the boardroom and we're standing outside the finest conveniences known to man really plush uh, this is this is what would normally be called the gents you can't merely be a gent to use these though as you can see you have to actually be a bona fide hero at the other side of the room there's a similar room for heroines so when you stride out of the boardroom you come and take up your seat in this the director's box so the seat i'm using will be used by perhaps the owner of the club uh, the managers might sit here depending on how they want to watch the game and other vips there are seats further along which are padded and lovely these seats are even more padded and lovely lovely um, cost a few quid but if you've got the few quid some people find it worth it uh, a fantastic view of the game you miss nothing from you miss nothing from any seat in the stadium actually but it's particularly nice here this by the way in case you're interested is just a, a barrier transparent so you can see the match and not fall over Two great things. The, the pitch is in beautiful nick. It's uh, been put back to the way it was after recent concerts by Beyonce and Pink. It's it's moored on average every every couple of days. Um, the flood lighting, it's not traditional anymore. You rarely see uh, floodlights on the old pylons, such as at Roker Park. They're on either side of the pitch. They're, they're about 130 in total. Um, and it costs around about £1,100 just to use them on a, on a match day when they're on all day. Now I actually know where the switches are to turn the floodlights on and off, but I'm not going to tell you where they are. Um, what I will say is though that they're actually a bit disappointing. They're just light switches such as you would have in your house, where you might imagine a great big handle such as you see in the horror films with lightning coming off it. Nothing to say really. Now we would have gone into what is Quinny's bar these days, it used to be just called the sports bar. It's a couple of doors through there but they're doing some work at the moment, it's going to be wonderful when it's done out. Uh, that's also been there since day one. Um, originally they, they were going to have a turnstile there, in fact they did put the turnstile in but the gimmick was supposed to be that every tenth person who walked through the turnstile, which is an old Roker Park turnstile, would get a big cheer as they ended. It never happened. But there's all sorts of interesting paraphernalia in there, including a fireplace from the boardroom at, at Roker Park. There are cabinets either side of uh, the reception, uh, ostensibly to put trophies in, so make your own unpleasant jokes, but there are still things to put in them. This, for example, is dedicated to 1973. We all know what happened then. And there's a little trophy there that was at the Sports Personality of the Year Award. Uh, suddenly we're given Team of the Year for 1973. And there's the trophy to prove it. Well, thank you for watching. We hope you've enjoyed our little film. And a very big thank you from us to Sunderland Football Club for their very generous access they've given us to the beautiful Stadium of Light. 26 years old now, but it's still the finest sports stadium within 250 miles of here. It's not the biggest, still the best.